as yet another year wraps up, I like to take some time to look back on the past 12 months, both in my personal life, did I spend enough time doing the things I actually want to do with the people I love, and in my work. I've been doing this process for multiple years now and have taken the time to also look back on some of the conversations I've had on this podcast. In this end of the year holiday special, I'd like to take you with me in this reflection process. I get to have conversations with people I genuinely think are some of the most thoughtful people out there, not just in building the next maps and satellites, but just overall. This podcast is called Minds Behind Maps after all. It's a quest not just to talk about the maps, but also the people behind them. Whether you're new to the podcast, just discovering these conversations for the first time, or have been listening to it for a while, I hope this episode will serve as a nudge for you to reflect on the year, gather new ideas, or revisit old ones, and take some time to think about the past 12 months before diving into the next 12. On top of many of the conversations I've had the chance to take part in this year, it has been a year for me of refining my process and my craft, but also one of trying to make this a sustainable endeavor. I talk a lot to people about building projects, companies, and structures that stand the test of time, and I believe in showing up again and again and again. As part of that, this year I started a Patreon. I want these conversations to be timeless pieces that keep providing value even years after they've been recorded. And as part of this, I'm asking for your support, you listening to these conversations, and that are hopefully getting value week after week. If you've gotten something from these conversations and share those values, I'd like to ask you to consider supporting my work on Patreon. A lot of the internet today is built around ads, algorithms, and frankly, a lot of clickbait. I don't want to build something that yields to that version of the internet. I want to build thoughtful, meaningful, and sometimes slower paced conversations, but these also take time, effort, and well, money to produce. I'm incredibly thankful to the people who've put some of their money behind my work to support it. You can also get access to some of the behind the scenes of this podcast, how I make it, where I break down how I had some of these conversations. On the topic of things that continue to show up day after day, year after year, let me start this holiday special with a segment from my conversation with Harold Godine, TomTom's founder and CEO. I had the chance to sit down with him this year at Amsterdam in their headquarters and talk about the huge ups and drastic downs the company has gone through in its more than 30 years history, from a household name to one that disappeared from the average person's sight. I invite you to go listen to the full conversation for more details on that, but I wanted to highlight here a segment of advice Harold has for people aspiring to become entrepreneurs and wanting to build new things. So here's the funny thing. If you, I, I don't know, I'm not 100% sure about the statistics and what I'm saying is actually correct or not, but it's probably, if you want to get rich, you probably better do the, you better go to the casino, put all your money in red. I think the chances that you, that you get rich out of a casino are probably higher than getting rich out of entrepreneurship uh, and 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 uh, even if the stacks in the casino are against you uh, i would think that the chances you make it as a starter in a meaningful way are not that high and some of the um Statistics seem to, I don't know, you read different statistics in different countries and the way you measure it. But I think by and large, um, uh, what is it, 5% or so of, of companies survive and do shit and make, make an impact. That's probably skewed towards the lower end because the people who fail in the first venture can really make it in the second venture or become more effective uh, in the work they do um, uh, uh, 
when they are work for a boss or in a larger organization. What I'm saying is, if you just do it for the money, then it's probably not a good idea. Uh, that is probably not the right motivation. Um, but the rewards are very significant if you do it because it's fun and it's yeah. it's crazy and you 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 assume a level of responsibility for your own doing that you don't get into working for a boss um, or hard. It's harder to get that, uh, and it is uh, phenomenally rewarding uh, if you you know if, if if it works. If it works. A little bit is even much more rewarding than what, you know, you don't, I'm not even talking about a billion, billion, a billion or a multi-billion dollar company, even though at a small scale, doing something for yourself and, and running that yeah. and being responsible for that and is already a massive achievement uh, and, 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 and can be a great so source of, of, uh, of, of joy and satisfaction. Uh, so, but it's also, you know, it's also quite hard at times it's tough and yeah. um, there's a lot at stake in many cases, especially if you're a bit older, you have family, you have a house, you have a mortgage, you have kids and what more, you know, losing a lot of money is not so funny anymore and can, uh, and can uh, create a lot of uh, stress and anxiety. I don't think there is a uh, silver bullet, there's no recipe that fits all. Um, what what is a what is a what a good start is is if you have real deep knowledge about a certain industry and and you are aware of certain problems that exist in that industry and where you have an idea how to fix that and be passionate about it. That is a that is a that's a that's a reasonable start to think about uh, entrepreneurship. Um, I have this plan, I see this going wrong, this can be done in a different way. That's 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 a good start. Uh, but even if there if you see a hole in the market, that doesn't mean there is a market um, in that hole. Um, and it's tough and you need a bit of luck and your time needs to be right. It's one of the most important things, the most difficult things you, you, you need to do. It's all it takes longer than you think. So you need to be, there are things you can do uh, in order to enhance your chances. Uh, doing it needs to come from kind of an inner conviction that you are smarter than everybody else in the globe, even if you know that it's kind of objectively that's not at all the case, but, but you need to have that level of, of of conviction that you, right. you know, you're going to fix this, you're going to do it, and everybody else, all the naysayers, you know. Um, that is at the same time it's a problem because if you think you're smarter than everybody else, you don't listen, and that makes that means you make very stupid mistakes. <laughs> so finding the right balance between having the conviction that you know better. You need to balance that with an ability to listen uh, and observe what's happening around you. There are entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs who scale, have problems that other entrepreneurs have in exactly the same way, maybe a different area, a different field, different, but you can learn from that. Um, I'm a fan of mentoring and coaching in that respect. Okay. If you have the time and if you have the Span, attention span. People around you, that's a fantastic way to avoid stupid mistakes. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, um, and don't run out of cash. <laughs> Sounds like pretty good advice. Don't run out of cash. John Gorman is someone I have a tremendous amount of respect for. From the outside looking in, he's a serial entrepreneur currently working on his fourth company after having been acquired by Snap, worked at Maxar, and is now dedicated to improving location on smartphone beyond GPS. But 
Beyond those feats, what drew me to spend time with Sean and sit down to talk with him was understanding more about his thinking process and his execution. Our conversation was packed with insights into how he builds many of the projects he's been working on, but I particularly wanted to highlight one around not everybody needing to know how to code to contribute towards the success of a project. Yeah, I think it's always been, you know, it's. I think it's important to understand how code works, um, but not everybody has to be writing code as their daily thing. I remember there was like a, um, I mean, maybe it was apocryphal, but you know, sort of like how Mark Zuckerberg wanted everybody at Facebook to code, and like even like the person in marketing had to know how to write HTML, and that like everybody was a coder that you know also did this other function. Um, and I don't know if it's true or not, but. Uh, but I always thought it was interesting because it was like it just you know it's like not everybody's good at the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and it always made sense if you're building a team, right? You want to have um, the right people for the right job. And even in grad school, it was like Raj was a far better coder than I was. Um, and and generally, like what my skill has been is is being able to see a big picture, like macroscopic things. Was going way back to being a visual learner, right? It, being able to see the big picture and see how things connect and and where things might be going. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I tended to be okay at was explaining complex things in simple ways. Um, and that was largely what I did in, in grad school. Like, you know, we would, we would brainstorm on ideas and sometimes it was Lori's idea, sometimes it was Raj's idea, sometimes it was my idea. And, and that was, you know, but when it came to actually implementing it, Raj was wonderful at, at writing the code. And then the thing that, that I did well, and, and Lori was the tenure track professor who understood how like academia worked and could plug us into grants and 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 knew how to do the network and so forth and and also had a, a wonderful simulation uh, and computational statistics background um, and then generally what I did was uh, I was good at explaining these complex ideas to the general public and the cool thing that I loved about public policy was that was a mandate and it's an unusual mandate in academia right because usually when you're publishing in academia. You're speaking to the ten other people that care about that very precise topic, yeah. and 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 academic productivity tends to be reductionist, in that you're constantly getting more honed into a more precise thing in order to be unique. Um, but there was two tricks that we. Well, and the thing that I loved about public policy was there was also a mandate of, you know, in order to do research in public policy, you have to. There's the public half of it, right? Is you need to inform the public so they understand how to cast votes to make more informed decisions around policy. So there's this whole mandate of, of that you really want to be able to explain your, your research to the average person. Um, so that one just resonated with where I thought there was value in academia. And, and part of where I had gotten disillusioned with geography becoming very postmodern, um, you know, it's, it's a fascinating construct, but nobody understands the vocabulary of, of postmodern critical theory outside of academia. So like you're just talking to each other and, it, it, there's just always the risk of it becoming navel gazing, which where I love about public policies that kind of flipped that and said, you know, all of this needs to go into informing the public. And, and that was something that I enjoyed. And also, I think as a result of enjoying it, I got better at it. Um, and it just so ended up that in, in technology, that's also a really important skill to take a really complex set of, of computational things or mathematical things and and go to the public which is the market or investors and explain to those people to those things of why that's important to them why it's impactful and why it makes uh, a big picture difference um so I think that ability to to connect them was was helpful uh, and especially early on when i was still a lot closer to the mathematics and i was actually doing them myself um that i understood how it worked under the hood even though i might be really bad at debugging it um, it allowed me to translate what that was to people that were interested in the outcome that that computation or mathematics created. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the, the, the thing I think that helped me succeed. What I like most about being able to have these conversations with so many different people on this podcast is trying to understand a little bit more about who these people are, how they think, and what drives them. This oftentimes reveals themes and topics that I didn't expect going in. And one such example is my conversation with John Daruk, the CTO of Felt, a company he describes himself as trying to make maps fun by bringing maps onto the browser and opening up real-time collaboration. 
More than the tech behind this, I wanted to know about what makes a map fun and why that matters. I think these tools, people spend hours and hours on like, of their hour, like days on these like mapping tools. You know, you talk to consultants, you know, they spend hours and hours in Photoshop, uh, PowerPoint or Excel, analysts use Excel. When you look at work with like mapping folks, they spend hours and hours on these tools. And if you can actually make it fun, A, it's more fun for us to build these tools. You know, we're also human. And the second is, I think if you make these tools fun, people go back to it. There's this, I think, almost intangible quality to certain tools where there's like millions of small interactions, like whether the UI is this color or things are like animated this way, or they pick this font or where they've picked this kind of copy that makes it more fun. The ironic fun is this quality where you go back and be like, you smile, but it, like you can tell the tool is on your side. And I think that's the sort of like quality that we're trying to espouse. Um, and then the reason why it's important is like, it's also part of like business thing. We want people to sort of feel good after using felt versus feel tired. Uh, there are definitely certain tools that I think like Notion is a good example. There's like certain things in Notion that you can tell, like this was made by people that are fun to hang out with. And then it just makes you feel happy to click around and there's like certain tools, you know, I'm not going to name any bad, I'm going to bad mouth any <laughs> tools, but there's certain tools you use them be like, oh man, this was an arduous process. And then you probably end up with the same results. You probably end up with the same artifacts, but you want to go back to the first one. You know, Slack is another great example. I think early on, no one could tell you why Slack was more fun than IRC or other chat tools, but it was fun. And I'm like, it just got adopted slow, like slowly, but steadily. And then became like the behemoth that we all know now. How do you build fun? It feels like it, I, I, I understand what you're talking about, like that, that experience, but then it's like engineering something that feels like that. How do you tackle that problem? I think that's, I would credit more of our, more to our like product team. Um, I think you just have to have this like taste for fun. I think if you want like something like systematic, you just need to be sort of have a personality in your tool. Like you need to sort of have like a stance and like be consistent with it. Uh, I think that's what we do systematically correct. You know, we just have this like, okay, like this is sort of like how we talk to our users. This is how like UI sort of like feels. This is how it should sort of it should leave you with this kind of feeling. And then we are somewhat like fearless in like, no, 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 like, you know, in our upload anything tool when we built it, right? Uh, the idea was that, you know, you drag in any file, it just kind of works. It is this like insanely powerful tool that probably nothing, you know, works like it does right now. But if you look at our first sort of uh, how we were like marketing it, our designer, Lauren, he has his dog, Daisy. He loves his dog. Like we've seen him multiple times, the dog. Um, in, the, um, in the UI, he was just like making this like, you know, like small like illustration. And he put like Daisy just like with, it, with like the, um, with his tongue out. And we're like, let's keep it. Like did a lot of people make maps with geospatial data, CSVs, geo packages, but there's also like a picture of like Daisy and like as part of the thing that is like upload anything, right? Because anything is anything. Like anything is not just like geo package and, you know, Esri, like arc shape files or, you know, like Excel. Like anything is also pictures of Daisy that are like geo tagged or maybe that's, that's also fine, you know? So you kind of like have this like, Yes, we work with CSVs. Yes, we will probably understand file formats that have like no one else does, but like we will also like happily take in like pictures of Daisy and uh, work with them. So I think that's what I'm talking about, like fearlessness, this like stance. Um, and I think that has served us well. Another topic I like to think about a lot and discuss on this podcast is the incentives and motivations companies and people have to do what they do. One of the companies I couldn't quite wrap my head around was Apple. They have had a map app 
uh, as far as I could tell, it's unlike anything Google does. They aren't leaning into the advertisement. So why would they invest so much into their maps? Well, to answer that this year, I talked to James Keelick, who's worked on the mapping side of things all the way back in 1985 in the automotive industry, and then worked at Apple for nearly 10 years. Why did Apple get into maps in the first place? Well, um, Apple actually initially got into maps because of photos um, back in, oh, I don't know, probably the mid-2000s as well. Um, you had the Photos app for your Mac. This is prior to the iPhone. And you stored all of your photos inside the Photos app uh, on your Mac. And um, you could organize those photos into albums, but Apple wanted it. Uh, to make it possible to kind of see where those photos were taken. And it was just starting to be the era where cameras, everyone was using point and click cameras, or maybe if you were a pro, you were using a DSL camera of some kind. Um, um, those cameras were just starting to get GPS um, attached to them. And so having that metadata associated with the photo about where that photo was taken was starting to become available and, and, and Apple wanted to make that possible to see where those photos were taken on the map. So that's how they initially got into the mapping business. But of course, the real the real catalyst for getting into the mapping business was launch of iPhone back in 2007. And so when, when Apple was developing iPhone, I wasn't at Apple back at the time, but Steve Jobs was very adamant that when they launched the iPhone, it came with a set of apps that would be kind of relevant to what you did with this mobile device sitting in your pocket. And so there was music on there, there was camera on there, so there was photos on there, there was your calendar, there was email, there was a web browser. And Steve said, okay, well, we need a mapping app because you're going to be mobile, and when you're mobile, you need a map. So we need a Maps app. And so um, Apple didn't know anything about mapping back in those days, and so... Um, they went to Google and they said, hey, you know, we'd like to use your data. And so they licensed the data from Google. Uh, the app itself was not developed by Google. The app was designed and developed. Um, the whole UI was designed and developed by Apple. Uh, but the tiles, the map tiles that came in underneath that were Google map tiles. And so that's what um, iPhone launched with back in 2007. And uh, it was, you know, part of the reason for the iPhone success is because now you're out and about and you could find out stuff. And if you look at a lot of the early ads for iPhone, um, a lot of the kind of use case ads that Apple did back in those days to show you what you could do with an iPhone were um, use cases revolving around, you know, oh, I want to go out to eat or find a sushi bar and, you know. So the, there were some great ads that kind of illustrated that. Um, but as time went on, post-2007, there were two things that Apple came to realize. Number one, um, with the Google Maps tile data, it really couldn't be in control of its own destiny in terms of the experience it wanted to provide to its end users. It was Google's map, and that was it. What was the, um, let, let me interrupt you there. What, what were in, in practice some of the shortcomings? Why, why was Google's data not enough? Um, so the map tiles back in those days were, I believe, raster map tiles. And so, you know, the rasters were developed with certain color schemes and, and, and you know, the, the, there was a limit to what you could do with that map data in right. terms of look and feel. Um, and, um, you know, if they wanted to do something different or add an extra layer of data, it would have been very difficult for I them see. to do that. Um, and so, so it was constraining in that regard. Um, um, to provide a complete experience, Apple realized they really needed to own the whole stack and they needed to own the map uh, and the map data. The other influence on the switch was, listen, Google, through the use of the app, through users' use of the app, knew everything about where you are and where you're going. 
and Apple didn't like that, right? They yeah, didn't fair enough. want their customers' location data going to Google so that Google could take advantage of it for advertising or, you know, some other use um, within their organization. In many ways, it's kind of like they own the, uh, the... The first thing that comes to mind is this analogy of like the App Store and the, the Play Store where like Google and Apple own kind of the operating system and what you can have on it. But this is the same thing, but for a map where Google would own like the mapping operating system in a way. And so I, I see Apple wanting to remove that and own. So those two things kind of point towards the direction Apple wanting to do their own full mapping application. Exactly, exactly. It's very, uh, I mean, the analogy I always draw is it's very similar to the silicon chip uh, story with Apple, right? Uh, you know, Apple was dependent on um, IBM and then later Intel for the silicon chips that it put in its devices. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, it realized it had to get out of that so it could control the whole stack and, and create, and, and in doing so, then be able to create the experience it wanted to create for its users. So let, let me, on, on that, I think there's one thing that comes from us. Like every company probably wants to own everything, but there's a reason why every app on your phone doesn't have its own operating system or all the other uh, computer OEMs like Dell and HP don't also create their own silicon. It's, these are incredibly costly and complicated endeavor. So there's like a, a, a trade-off. If you're a, a Dell, like what you're going to try to focus on is creating, I don't know, a great uh, experience for the user who doesn't actually really care about what's underneath it. So th there's this trade-off, right, between we're going to own everything, but that's going to cost a lot of money. How how do you justify that as well? That that that's yeah, it's an excellent point, Max, and um, one worth delving into. In the case of Apple getting into the silicon business, I think when they dived into the silicon business, they knew full well it was going to cost them a boatload of money to start, you know, building the domain expertise and you know um, to develop, design, develop, and fab get chips fabricated. I mean, they don't make chips, but um, yeah, the design, you know, the hard yeah, work, yeah, yeah. the design, and everything. Um, so they they dove into that with with the with the knowledge that hey, you know this is this is going to cost us a lot of money, and we'll need to invest billions of dollars in in order to make this work. And you're right, there are very few companies on the planet that can afford to do that. And Apple was in a fortunate position to do them, to do that with with chips. Maps, however, is a completely different story. Um, when Apple decided to switch from Google Map tiles or Google Map data to its own map in 2012, I think there was a little bit of naive thinking going yeah, on. Yeah, I'm other guessing words, there's that. It's like either you know it's going to cost a lot of money and you prepare for it, or you're probably just naive and you go in it. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, think about... Think about the, the industry back in those days. So what was around at Apple? So one of the most successful products at Apple back in those days was um, iTunes. And so you could not only upload your songs, but also there was the iTunes library and you could buy songs and you know pay 99 cents for a song or buy an album. And so they knew all about songs. And they thought, well, you know, maps, that can't be too hard. It's kind of like iTunes. It's about albums and genres and artists and songs <laughs> and, you know, maps. It's pretty similar. It's about roads and streets and, you know, street names. It must be the same. Um, unfortunately, um, they forgot that, you know, maps change a little more frequently than albums and songs and artists and, you know, the, the 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 songs on an album um, stay the same. They don't change. You know the the songs on that that um, David Bowie album. You know um, yeah. don't change. Whereas a map, they change. And so I think there was a little bit of. I I wasn't there at the time, but I think there was a little bit of naive thinking going on. Uh, oh yeah, we could do this. It's, it can't be too hard. And then of course they launched in in 2012 and. Um, you know, 
they they got the black eye for those of you that don't know the story in 2012 they launched it was not a good launch it's one of the most embarrassing launches product launches that apple has ever done tim cook had to issue an apology uh, and tell tell users you know try these other apps instead of our map you know i'm sorry i'm actually i'm, I'm not familiar i, I read that that happened but i'm actually not familiar with what happened yeah so what what happened was quick you know they launched it with great fanfare and it had a few cool features like a flyover feature so you could fly over landscapes uh, with satellite photography and it all looked very cool but the underlying data was not very good and the underlying data came from tom tom and others and um it wasn't just about the data it's about how you make use of the data so just because just because you have data doesn't mean that you're going to provide good directions you've got to create those algorithms to figure out what's the best route from a to b and do you take that road or this road and the algorithms that apple had created for example for directions weren't very good and they were sending people the wrong way and the geocoding wasn't very good. In other words, the process of finding an address wasn't very good. Right. And and so people quickly got frustrated and and you know, the media um caught wind of this and there were all these stories of, you know, how bad Apple Maps was and um it quickly became a huge embarrassment. And and that's what precipitated Tim Cook's apology. Uh, there was a guy who was responsible for for maps, uh, a guy called uh, Steve Forstall, who was uh, essentially fired um, okay. because of the debacle. And um, it was an interesting period. I think, um, you know, there was a lot of head scratching going on at the time. You know, this is this is terrible. We've had this big disaster. Should we get out of the mapping business or should we stay in it? You know, should we just go back to using Google Maps? I'm sure that question went around the corridors at Apple. Um, but I think they quickly came to realize that, you know, maps and location have so much to do with everything you do every day that absolutely, you know, mapping and navigation has to be a core confident, a competence that we develop. And so it wasn't a question then of taking their foot off the gas it was a question of putting your foot flat to the floor and getting the uh the the you know building the organization that they needed to build in order to to build the product that you see in apple maps today and it took them 10 years it really took 10 years to do that i think apple maps is you know in many countries around the world is a, is is at least as good as as what you get from google in some ways it's better in some other parts of the world, it's not as good. Obviously, there's still more work to do, but um, but it, but it was a 10-year journey to get there. Originally, what attracted me to talk to Mila Luleva, the head of remote sensing at the Netherlands' second largest bank, Rabobank, was to ask her a pretty simple question. Why does a bank care about satellite images? And I invite you to listen to the full conversation to get answers and the rationale behind that question. But today, I wanted to highlight her reflections on comparing the work done in academia and in the private sector, how they have different incentives and how to navigate them. Don't get me wrong, I love research. I really do. And I think that is, um, well, part of the creativity and exploration, of course. Again, let's, uh, let's get back to the start of the conversation. But and and. Again, as a disclaimer, also, as we discussed earlier, I really support academia and I don't believe that it is something that should disappear. I um, truly believe that it's not for everybody. I really do believe that. And it was just not for me. And the reason, multiple reasons. Um, on one hand, I did not um, fully support your measuring an academic on the number of projects they bring into a university. I mean, that is a completely different job, I feel. You know, you as an academic need to be bringing knowledge, need to be uh, educating people, need to be raising the new generation of scientists and spreading your knowledge and not applying for money. I mean, this is what most of the time they do, which uh, is strange. And then taking that uh, further down the line, let's say you got your money on your project, you're doing your work, you hired a number of PhDs, you did whatever you had to do. Money finishes, project finishes. No continuation, not, no 
um, nothing happens with your work. You published a number of papers, probably that if you managed, excellent. And that's the end of it. And then it just stops. And then you start writing a new project and you forget about all of the commitments that you have made along the way, all of the developments you did along the way. It somehow, somehow has this end. And, and I, I, I don't believe in that end. I believe in, you know, building something for without an end, you know, to, to continue. And that is something I did not really, I, I didn't really like. Um, and um, then what I did is when I shifted, I moved to um, to a research and development company. So I was leading the research and development team of a company. And there what I also saw is that once you enter the corporate world, you see that there is so much innovation. There is so much development happening, but because of IP, it is closed. So nobody knows really what really is going on in those companies and in their R&D departments and the incredible developments that are there. And especially in, in that particular case, you know, for me, it was very clear. I was uh, working for a company that was building um, machine learning models for um, soil, soil spectroscopy, so detecting different soil elements. And this was also part of my PhD. And in my PhD, you know, we were really, I was within the academic world seeing where this is going. The moment I shifted to that company, I saw this incredible advancement, something that I've never seen in the academia, like in terms of results, in terms of databases, in terms of quality. And it was never shown to the world. And I thought, what a waste, <laughs> what a waste. But this is what a lot of innovation happens in those companies. And I, I dare say a lot more than what happens at universities. And, and, and I feel partly because of this, the previous problem that I mentioned, clever, incredible people are focusing on funding. <laughs> yeah. But let, let's talk about IP. So individual uh, property, no, intellectual, intellectual property, sorry, <laughs> intellectual property. Um, is that something that you're trying to do at Rabobank to kind of mm. put it out there a little bit um, to, you know, I'm sure there's a lot yeah. of really cool things happening as well and trying to get it out of, of yeah. that gate wall? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because um, as I mentioned, for me, very important is, are the two things, quality and transparency. And I think if you are uh, sitting on your IP and, you know, protecting certain things that, you know, that, that nobody should see, that, that defeats the purpose of transparency. And I believe, of course, I think I also, I mentioned it multiple times that, um, of course, companies need to make money out of their own IP, right? So that's why they're closing certain systems and, and certain methods and what they do. But I feel that if you are to really, uh, for example, in the case of the carbon market, if you'd like to win that game, you have to be as transparent as possible. Because the moment you say this is something that is a black box and I'm not going to tell you about it, it creates it starts, the questions start there. You're hiding, you're cheating, you're doing, you know. So everything that I would like us to do is, I would like it to be open. And and again, to the impact that we were talking about, if I open it and people can take it and build businesses or help other people or make bigger impact with it, my mission is accomplished, right? And, and it's not here for me to keep, it's for me to share and to help. Uh, reach more um, a wider audience. Yet another common topic on this podcast is the impact of satellite imagery. And one of the biggest impacts has been allowing us to be aware of climate change today. Without many of these satellites, we wouldn't have most of the data used to model and measure the changes happening today. But the history of many of these satellites and technologies comes directly from military applications. When earlier this year I talked to Ian Woodhouse about synthetic aperture radar, we discussed how and why radar images are interesting, but I also wanted to ask him about why he emphasizes the military history of these satellites to his students in his teaching. It's important to communicate it because students have to be able to engage in that topic. Um, they have to be able to understand that the Venn diagrams overlap considerably in terms of you know, military intelligence interests and um, environmental or other um, civilian applications. Is that the, in terms of the technology, so we see that just now in, you know, commercial companies, especially the commercial radar companies are being paid to collect 
tons of data all the time over the Ukraine, right? I assume mostly um, American Department of Defense is, is paying for that. But the, uh, and that's partly because you can see through the clouds and you can see in the dark, so you're guaranteed to have that coverage um, all the time. Um, so I, I try to make sure that my students kind of understand that they can't step away from the discussion, right? They can't say, um, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with things that are related to um, military intelligence and defense. It's like, well, the whole history of synthetic capture radar, or the whole history of radar is a, is a, milita- is a, as a military tool. Right. Um, so radar is a military tool that we have found civilian applications for. Uh, the classic false color composite where you put your near infrared into the red channel so you get your red, green, and blue color composite and you put near infrared into the red, the red into the green, and the green into the blue. Those color, do you know, do you know the history of where the, that color? No. Do you know the color composite type I mean? And it means that all the vegetation looks red. Yeah. Right. The history of that was color infrared photography because the way that the color, um, the, the chemical bands for the different colors for the color infrared photography is that that's how it recorded it so that that when you process the film is that the the film layer that was sensitive to the near infrared would look red and the film layer that was sensitive to the green would look red that i've lost track i need to write that down but you know the different channels and that so and that that was uh developed as color infrared photography in order to overcome the fact that people were using camouflage right so it was a military tool in order right. to identify that, well, if you paint your, if you used to use optical photographs in your surveillance, right? So, you know, World War One, they were already taking photographs from mm-hmm. aircraft to try to map out where everybody was. Um, and then people say, well, we'll just paint, we'll just paint camouflage. We'll paint our tank. So you paint it green. Yeah, we'll paint it green and then you won't see it in amongst all the vegetation. And they said, well, okay, let's develop because the tanks aren't highly reflective in the near infrared and the vegetation is. So we'll develop this color film that we can use for surveillance so that the tanks will turn up dark amongst the very bright vegetation. And so that, that color banding comes from that color infrared photography. Um, now, interestingly, it's, military has all moved on. So camouflage paint is now highly reflective in the near infrared, right, to get around that. So they've had to move on. But our remote sensing community still use that color combination as a kind of a default where the vegetation looks red. You pick up any introduction introduction to remote sensing textbook and you flick through it and you'll see a picture that's got a, oh, the vegetation looks red. Why, why do that? That's yeah. a weird thing to do. And it's only because historically that was the color bands of the uh, near infrared color photography. Cause you're trying to see the difference between the vegetation and the other thing that you're looking yep, for. Exactly. So when that other thing that you're looking for, that's, if that's what you care, you kind of look for something else but it turns out it's actually also great for seeing vegetation and if you care about vegetation you can just keep using that yeah i, do, I mean it identifies the vegetation vegetation pretty easily and then you know all, most of what we know about the history of the arctic sea ice is um yeah. is from military measurements um and so we uh, i think it's important that we kind of engage and recognize that that's you know we are inextricably linked to military surveillance and that's partly because civilian inventions will be used by the military and military inventions will eventually be used by the by the civilian domain right i mean pretty much i'm not ah could i find evidence i'm pretty sure i think it's not um i think it's well documented that you know most of the origins of the very high resolution optical sensors that came into the civilian domain you know round about the turn of the century were companies that had been building these things for military contracts for a while, and then the technology becomes declassified so they can sell it in a civilian domain. I mean, in, in radar, in the star world, that's exactly what's happening as well. Is if you want to start a company, it's, it's going to require a lot of upfront money, a lot of upfront capital to be able to build that company that builds and launch satellites. So you want to have, you want to be sure that some people are going to be able to pay for that and you can make a profit yep. off of it so that means you need huge contracts that justify all that upfront investment and right now it's still a little bit up in the air as to whether there's commercial applications that can sustain those industries enough but there is military there are military contracts that can support this so 
It's also true in, in, in the SAR world, in a lot of the companies that are being built are only able to exist because of the huge military contracts that, that can sustain those companies. And then they have to go on to try to see, can we make it work with, uh, with commercial down the line? So I think there's an interesting difference between Europe and North America in that context. Right. So I think American um, companies, especially in the SAR domain, um, have an advantage because they will get big contracts from the DOD to, to c keep the lights on. Um, I don't know about more recently, but I'm fairly sure that ISAG originally, you know, didn't start off in that domain. And, you know, uh, and their progression was probably slower as a consequence, right? They, but, you know, ISAG are very successful at doing what they do. Um, it may be that they have had to capitulate and, and are now doing military contracts. I don't know. But the, uh, but other, you know, you look at the American companies and they're definitely getting military contracts that get them set up very quickly. And I think it's that disadvantageous to the, 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 to SAR generally, because the military intelligence just say, well, I want really high resolution. Give me the highest resolution possible. Right. Uh, because actually, uh, we just have experts that have do visual interpretation of that and we want it as quick as possible every time we want it so seeing through clouds and seeing at night and being having a pointing ability that's perfect just do that for us and and it's possible much more likely maybe is that the commercial civilian opportunities in SAR are, are possibly more in the information that you get out of the phase information so those ground displacements and um the very subtle differences that you can pick up with SAR. And that's much harder to do. And the, so the commercial companies, they're generally not optimized for doing interferometry. If there's one person who's been thinking about building better open data approaches, I think that would be Jed Sunwell. He was behind AWS's Open Data Registry program and is now the executive director of Radiant Earth, a nonprofit dedicated to increasing accessibility to Earth observation data and machine learning models. We talked about the work he does here and towards the end of that conversation, discussed the impact that new AIs like ChatGPT might have on many open source data projects and what value data and these large language models can provide. One of the things that I'm really curious to get your opinion on is this move towards companies, I think it's specifically companies, are realizing that the way people access data or rather information online is changing. What used to happen is you have this great source of data. People want information. That's, that's what we want. It's not data. We want information. That's right. I don't know. I want to know how to cook something. I don't want the recipe. I want to know how to cook it. Like the recipe is a tool to get there. And you used to go to Google and you're like, blah, blah, blah. I want to make spaghetti, whatever. And you go there and it links to a website that tells you this. Or in the example that I want to bring up, how do I code this little thing? You go to Stack Overflow and Stack Overflow tells you, well, the community is like, oh, there's, I tried these things. Now that got scraped, OpenAI got like trained a model on it you don't need all these other sources of data and you don't need to go to stack overflow anymore if we if we kind of roll the clock a, a little bit on what open ai does and so uh this is a long premise to say stack overflow i think announced quite recently they were going to charge for yeah. their api yeah so this is a complete different move towards open data as a response to how that data seems to be used long setup to ask the question, how do you think that goes towards the open data model as a whole? Uh, I mean, yeah, this, this is... Again, a really big question. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. No, this, it's an important, this is a super important thing to talk about, like, these days. Um, yeah, there's like, okay, so within within Amazon, like Amazon's culture, there's this this concept of day one. Um, that sort of like, this is Jeff Bezos' thing. It's like, it's day one for the internet. Like, you know, Amazon is like, I don't know how old now, over 25 years old, but it's always just like, it is day one for the internet. Like we have no idea what this thing's going to be. There's so much potential ahead of us. Like 
don't ever get caught in sort of the trap of like, this is how it is. Like, um, and it's a big part of the culture is just to be like, we are just getting started. Um, and, uh, to the point that like, it's really funny, like a date, like the worst thing you can say to somebody at Amazon is like, that's day two thinking, you know, just like, <laughs> <to be> like <laughs> so this is the thing, like we're, we're, you know, I basically grew up on the internet. Um, I've watched it go through a lot of different phases. Um, and we're entering a new phase. Like, I think, um, th this might seem, uh, orthogonal here but like i think like what twitter what, what elon musk has been doing with twitter is very interesting where like he's just shutting off api access and like really raising the rates on on api access and it's going to be interesting to see how the market responds to that like to see if he can keep this thing afloat doing that but but i think he's in a sense he's right i mean i always feel like unfortunately i feel like i have to caveat anything i say yeah. about elon musk like I'm not a huge fan like uh um but that doesn't mean he's like wrong about everything. I think the the truth is there has been a lot of magical thinking that has infected um, the venture capital community and like a lot of the people building the internet that like, let's just build things to scale. Um, the best way to do that is to make things free and just like drive lots and lots of usage and then we'll figure out how to monetize it later. And it's like, okay, well, we're learning like that doesn't always work. It doesn't, doesn't end well. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of all about the a future of the internet where it's like, if you provide like a valuable service and you, you create uh, something like stack overflow, which harvests tons of useful content from across the internet, like you, sh you should figure out how to charge for access to that. Especially if you're charging people who are building businesses on top of it. Um, this is where we get into another interesting conversation about sort of like the nature of data or like the ergonomics of data, which is that like you, you know, using stack overflow and you're limited by your ability to type a, a question into google or into some other you know stack overflow search and click on responses and read those responses and ingest those that sh that should be free right and you can so you can put ads on those pages and stuff like that and create an experience where like humans that are limited by human cognition um and human faculties get the content for free if you are going to turn on a machine that scrapes their like entire website, you should you should pay for that right, you know? Like so you get one or two articles for or whatever. You get as many articles as a human can consume in a day for free. Um at what point are you like, all right, it's too much? Is it like is it like a hundred stack overflow responses? Like when do you start sort of throttling people and be like, hey, you're looking at too much stuff? Um, you know, newspapers are figuring this out uh like how to do that but I, I do think like it's totally appropriate for people to start putting those limits on things and to go back to your question about like how does this relate to like open data it that's an interesting problem to solve that's a, that's actually a, it, it's something that i'm interested in working on with source is that i should yeah be explicit about this like i want people to be able to charge for data products if they want to um as an open data guy that's like trust me like that feels like heresy for me to say something like that. But like, the truth is, is that I, well, maybe this isn't the truth, but I have a hunch that there are data products that would be available to people. If only it were easier for somebody to charge for access to them. This is like how markets work. Like markets work to make things exist and available to people if they want them, if they want to pay. Can you elaborate on that? Or maybe did you have an example uh, that, that you have in mind? Of like of a of a data product that would exist if people would charge for it. Yeah, because I pay, pay I I have a sense that I sort of think that's true, but I'm not quite yeah. sure I actually get your point. Yeah. So like, I don't have a super ready example. There's one I've used before. Like, so like in the United States, census data is openly available. So we have a we have a tremendous census program, um, and produces extremely high quality survey data about the country. And it's all, it's almost all open. Um, it's open in, in aggregate levels because they don't want to like give away personal information. Again, census being kind of, I actually don't know if I get this right, but it's like how many people are where? Yeah, that's roughly it. You know, how many people are where? Um, how much money do they make? Like what level of uh, education have they attained? They, they, they gather lots of like really interesting data. But so like one, so the example I use is like Spanish speakers, like how many people speak, like how many Spanish speaking households are there? So the way census data is made available, it, 
is this will sound familiar to you based on what you said about like how hard it was for you to get like a Sentinel image. It, you have to have like a master's degree to like know how to work with Sentinel da- or sorry, with census data. It's just it's very complex. The, the Census Bureau, does, they do a pretty good job of making it easier for people, but it's never going to be easy. So say, for, say you wanted to have um, the percentage of Spanish-speaking households in the United States organized by zip code, which is a certain administrative boundary we use here, um, mostly for, for, for the, the Postal Service. That data, you cannot ask the Census for that right now. Somebody might, might, might tell me this is easy, but my understanding is it's not easy to, to get this from census data, but it's possible. And so there are likely marketing firms and other organizations that want to reach Spanish speakers in the United States that go through the hassle of figuring out how to get this data. And they are all going to the census department and producing a CSV of zip codes and the percentage, percentage of Spanish speakers there. Um, let's say it costs them $1,000 each to do this. If only there were a way, like it was very easy for somebody to like just sell a CSV um, and like, and on a, on a, on a data marketplace, um, it would be, it might be possible for somebody to produce that data product and charge like 50 bucks for it and, and drive the cost down. Now, uh, like I've said, Source Cooperative is a data publishing utility. It could emerge to become a data marketplace at some point, but this is just the example I use of, of something that like, I feel like it could exist on the market if only we're cheaper to get it to the market. Right, right now, I mean, the way most people sell data right now is through like data as a service companies, and you're going to take, potentially take venture money. If you go down that route, you're going to have to create, you're going to have to scale. You're, you're building a SaaS business that you have to lock people into. Um, and so you're going to lock people into some sort of proprietary data delivery mechanism. And that works, but it's an ex- it works sometimes, but it's a very expensive process. I mean, you have to take on a lot of money to build this. You have to build your platform. You have to get, make people aware of it and get them to come to you and open their wallets and pay you and stuff like that. That's very, very expensive. And I'm a, like, I have this hunch that like, if we could just make it cheaper for just people to publish a data product somewhere and slap a price on it, then maybe we'd get more interesting stuff out there. Javier de la Torre started out as a biologist researcher, now turned entrepreneur. He started companies after seeing a disconnect between the science and the policies put in place, specifically around biodiversity loss and climate change. During our conversation, he reflects on where we are today and if some of the efforts to educate and make these losses more visible were successful. Looking, you know, a year behind, like, are we doing progress on these things? And same goes to climate change and so on. We, we, we can talk about that. But in the case of biodiversity, the general answer is a very clear no. I mean, like, we are now, uh, you know, like, species are disappearing at the highest, at the highest rate ever. I mean, like, it is considered that, you know, like, more than 40% of, you know, like, populations of, you know, like, I think, like, there's even studies that more than 50% of bird populations are gone. And if you look at, you know, like, uh, in the insects and different color, like, entire groups, I mean, like, it, there is an massive est- uh, extinction going on, and we have not stopped it. And in a way, if you look back, I mean, like, one of the ways that we thought about, like, bridging the gap between between science and policy making, we, we thought like maybe it's just not visible enough. So you know, like I was also very inspired by you know, remember the uh, uh, the Al Gore movie around the inconvenient truth, right on climate change. So it was for the first time the first documentary that in a way was like, okay, well this is actually really making it visible, making visible the issue. You know, like you cannot deny it, or you're in a way. I mean, like this idea of you know, like we we have to, uh, yeah, we have to educate, you know policy and, and the general public around it. And I think after all these years of advocate, of showing, you know, like data stories, showcasing, you know, the declines, showcasing the impacts of climate change and so on, I, I, I mean, I think we have to be honest to ourselves and it hasn't worked. It has not worked. We've, uh, I think now we've shown in so many different ways, you know, the biodiversity decline in the impacts of climate change. I like it. It is hard to not believe that. You, I mean, people are really fully aware of it and still it's going at an incredible pace. So awareness, it's clearly not enough to call like resolve the issue. Um, 
And, you know, like that was in a way we were naive. We thought like if people would see what was happening, they would stop. And the answer to that right now, I, th I think we were, it wasn't right. I, I don't think, you know, like it has worked. Has it, has it helped? Certainly hope, but it has it really fixed the issues. I mean, by no means. I mean, we knew that it was not going to be enough, but I think, you know, we, we had much higher hopes on the power of data visualization for bringing awareness to a topic and, and the, and the outputs that this would produce than it actually turned out to be the actual real impact. The early 2020s will inevitably be marked by the impact of the COVID pandemic in the history books. And part of how we were able to keep track of what was going on was due to maps reporting on the number and location of new cases. Quite quickly, the John Hopkins COVID dashboard became the go-to map that most people tuned into, being seen over a trillion times by the time it was taken down. This year, I got to sit down with Dr. S.T. Girarthi, the chief medical officer at ESRI, to talk more about the story behind this dashboard. I think the the biggest example that of the recent years has got to be COVID's. Yeah, Esri was working uh, with John Hopkins to make like probably one of the most famous maps if I don't know recent years or decades maybe. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how that project happened? As maybe let's let's use that as, as a as a case study basically of some of the work that you might be doing. I'm sure there's others, but this is probably the most well known. I can tell you that the Johns Hopkins dashboard is the most viral map based application in history. That's a nice pun. Yeah, <laughs> viewed trillions of times. So that's like first of all, like just want to pause on that. Like it's mind boggling. It's down now, right? It was oh, up yeah. for three years. Like that's also March the thing. It's was... not. It's not be going on for 20 years. It's We're talking trillions of views over just three years. Well, I'll start with uh, the person who created it was uh, En Sheng Dong. He goes by Frank. And he was an Esri intern one summer. Okay. And so he was familiar with GIS. And uh, then he decided to do his PhD studies at Johns Hopkins. And, of course, early into his efforts, this uh, infection started to show itself. And his family is from the region in China where this began uh, nearby. So he was concerned about his family. And because he was interested in tracking infectious diseases as part of his PhD program, he talked to his advisor about it. There was, you know, a a coffee meeting and figuring out, well, you know, what, what should we all do? And uh, they decided to build a dashboard. Right. And so he looked for data sources. He found a couple of good data sources that he could use. And uh, at that point, it was contained in China and put out the dashboard. And he built the dashboard because it's a configurable tool and pretty easy to use. He did it in about eight hours overnight. Okay. And of course, it's been refined many times. And also, interestingly, it was initially built on a student account. Right. right. So so how could it get any easier, right? It's, he saw something, he found the data, he put it in a dashboard, and his advisor, uh, Dr. Lauren Gardner, tweeted it. And we noticed... Um, it started to get a lot of views, yeah. and that was very quick. And then we started to see other dashboards kind of copycatting what they had done. They looked very similar. I mean, even with the black background and the red dots, uh, very similar indeed, and using similar data resources. Um, but the traffic was getting to be too big for a student account. And so the part where Esri stepped in was we we contacted Johns Hopkins and said, hey, we see you're getting a lot of traffic on this. Can we help you, you know, beef it up the infrastructure, put it in a place where it can can manage the traffic? And so uh, we helped to support. They, of course, are at the same time building more team members, gathering more data sources as uh, the infection was spreading around the world. So a lot of different things going on at the same time. But, uh, you know, we not me personally, but my colleagues had regular, I think probably weekly or often more frequently meetings with the team at Johns Hopkins to keep this going, to develop new ideas, 
Um, you will notice if you look at the first tweet to the last iteration of the dashboard, it went through significant changes. Um, but incredibly valuable resource. Not only did everybody love, love, uh, <laughs> feel inspired to check the dashboard multiple times a day, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. But um, a lot of people use that data because Johns Hopkins made sure that open data, back to that theme, was foundational for everything they did. People must be able to access the data. So we made it available in uh, in our system, in the Living Atlas, and it was available on GitHub. So whatever people wanted to use, they had an avenue and and that made the copycatting of more dashboards even more profound. Mm. Literally thousands of dashboards around the world relied on that data. Rennie Babyarks has a background at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the NGA in the United States, and has worked on multiple open source intelligence stories. Using publicly available satellite images, but also other sources of data, they piece stories about oftentimes things that we might otherwise not have been able to see. When I had him on, we talked about how him and his team had discovered a potential new nuclear weapons testing site in China. We talked a lot about how they found this in the first place by looking at satellite images, but I wanted to bring some light to a passage later on in the conversation around the nuance that's required to tell such a story. The other part that I really want to talk about is the the communication part. I've I've heard you yeah. talk about in a previous talk like how important that is, not just the finding, but how you share that yes. to the world. Yes. And so in this case, what's the process of you, you you talked about that, you alluded to if it's something big, you you might want to share it to the press. What's the the decision process about that? And then I'd love to talk about actually doing that and sharing and talking with journalists and sharing it to the public? Sure. Uh, that's another great question. And I would say that the mode of communication affects how you communicate it. And so if it's a conversation or an interview with a journalist, you know, in my case, I contacted the journalist said, hey, I think that this is important. Uh, you might want to run a story on this. Here's the information. And then in that case, I talked to the journalist and then I also provided the journalist with background information that I had produced that I was allowed to release to, to him to say, Here, here's what we've what we found. So here's the here's the backup information. Here's the information that supports what I'm saying. So you can take my interview, but then here's some background information to to show you the evidence. Um, so that's one way of communicating. Um, but then really any form of communication that's going to be public in any way you need to take very a, a great deal of care in the words that you use to describe what you're observing um, different words mean different things and you want to make sure that you're very careful in in making in making it clear just how certain you are about what you're saying like um, that that gets into words like caveat or probability like we think this is if you've ever heard a language like this this is a probable truck you're like what is a probable truck that doesn't make any sense it's just a truck or it's not a truck right well no if you're le if you're dealing with remote sensing data you will want to make it clear to your audience this is what i think this is and i'm going to show you a picture of it but it's just three blue pixels but it's just three blue, pi blue pixels and here's my level of confidence in what i'm saying that it is and if it's just three blue pixels, you might want to be really careful in trying to go public with that because one aspect of communication uh, that I, I think you're starting to allude to is, is how do people get convinced that what you're saying is right? Now, that's both the strength of satellite imagery and the weakness of satellite imagery. The strength is that people can relate to a picture very quickly. If I say, this is a truck, and it kind of looks like a truck from the top view, you say, yeah, yeah, that is a truck. I've just communicated something to you, an observation, and you now agree with it. That's quite powerful. I mean, that's a simple example, a truck. But if it's a truck at a nuclear weapons underground facility, I mean, you can just start piling on the different meanings there. Then it can become quite a big deal. Then it's more than just a truck. Um, but that's also the weakness of satellite imagery because 
it can sometimes too easily convince people of things because it's so easy to visually make sense of certain images, especially electro-optical images, you know, just, um, so you have to be very careful when you're communicating that you respect both. You respect the strength of it and not, you're not trying to trick people. I would say you have to be responsible and then account for the weakness, uh, which is if you're wrong and you've convinced people and you've done it in part because you're using this very convincing picture, uh, then you know that's a problem. You don't want to do. You shouldn't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to be presenting bad information, disinformation, which might be accidental, or misinformation where you're intentionally misleading people. And there are lots of current examples of that. Uh, so one one quick example is the new missile silo fields. I don't know if you talked with Jeffrey Lewis about this, but his organization, um, you know, the Middlebury Institute, put out some publications about China's new missile silo fields in different parts of the country. There are now three major new ones. Um, And they did, they did some good work on that. Uh, Well, at the time the first report came out, I think it was with Washington Post, I believe a prominent Chinese foreign service officer put out on Twitter a claim that those were not missile silo fields. In fact, they were windmills. China was building windmills. This is a wind farm, a wind generation farm. So that official's statement on Twitter would be an example of misinformation. Taking something that people might be able to see visually and say, well, that's not a missile silo field. That, that, they're building windmills there. Intentionally trying to mislead the public with that information. I, I can say intentionally because we, we also studied this. We had a customer that hired us to study that and actually test that exact claim to say, are these windmill fields or missile silos? And we did a full analysis and said, well, they're definitely not windmills. (laughs) And we think they're probably missile silos in accordance with, you know, multiple other organizations as well. I personally know quite a lot about how to map the outside world, but I don't really know what it takes to map the indoors. Hongwei Liu has been working on this problem for the past 12 years, so he was probably one of the best people to explain the challenges around it. Um, at a very high level, we build upon the work done by others. We, we're turning pieces of paper into digital records and then building tools that allow anybody to improve those records. Um, so yeah, at a high level, we can we can talk about kind of the new stuff coming out since. But do you have an example maybe of that? Of yeah. what that looks like. Every building has a map, right? Um, some have eight, right? If you walk into a building, by law, there's a fire escape map posted somewhere. Someone made that. It's just a piece of paper now. It's mostly wrong, right? It doesn't have enough detail to be useful for if you're looking to find an empty room somewhere or find Santa Claus. But it has the balls, it has the structure, it has the important stuff. Um, Let me interrupt you there. What do you mean by it's mostly wrong? It's out of date. It's out of date and it doesn't have enough detail to be useful at this point. So I I guess wrong is not the right word. It serves a vital purpose as a fire safety map, um, but it doesn't serve a purpose as a general map at this point. Okay. And so every building has that. Every building was built by an architect, assuming it's you know under 200 years old. And I know in Europe, that's not always the case. Um, so somebody built it. And when they built it, they had plans. And those plans are essentially maps. Um, so start with that. Start with the piece of paper. Digitize it as fast as you can in the most efficient way that you can. And then realize that since the building was built or the, or the fire safety inspector drew that fire safety map, things have changed. And the problem is the person who made that map in the beginning is long gone. Those were the experts. But what you have left are office managers, facility managers, marketing coordinators, um, cleaning people, produce managers at the grocery store. These are the people who are walking around the building every day who are responsible for maintaining the building. And every now and then, they take that piece of paper and they print it out and they scribble on it with a pen um, to say, okay, well, I, I just need to know for me that this is wrong, this is right, here's, here's where things are. And they might scan that piece of paper in and email it to their boss to be like, by the way, this is what I just did, 
right? I'm the produce manager at uh, the local grocery store. We had too many cucumbers today. Here's where I put them. Just so you know, this is where they are now. And and eventually that PDF, let's say, um, gets re-digitized by an expert at head office or outsourced to an expert at a consulting firm using Photoshop or something like that into a new digital map. And that gets printed out next time. So that's that's the status quo of mapping indoors today. And what we realized early on at Mapped In is, well, A, we were we were the ones being sent those scribbles. And we just hated Photoshopping. It just seemed so inefficient. So being engineers, we thought, let's build a tool for ourselves. Let's build a tool that we would prefer to use because it's faster so that we can maintain a digital map without having to retrace and re-Photoshop every single time somebody sends us a scan. And that's really become the main tool today at Mapped In. Um, and here I will, without talking too much, I, I will point out that there's a difference between maps and models. Uh, maps are abstractions, right? It's models are real world. And, and all the time we get asked by folks like, how do you make street view? It's like, wow, we don't, we don't make street view because you don't use street view in your car when you're navigating and driving from A to B, you use a map. Um, whereas a lot of folks I think are also trying to build 3D models of the world for autonomous driving and for things like that. Um, oh, I see and, what you mean. And that's, okay. that's an area we can go into as well. Steve Brumby has a long history of bringing deep learning and maps together, starting to work at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the early 2000s, to then being the co-founder of Descartes Labs and now have started the Impact Observatory. Steve is someone who's built complex maps at scale and seen how they get used and what impact they have. In this specific segment from our conversation, Steve makes the case that data and maps can come in as tools that build trust. Rather than trusting organizations on how sustainable they are, we can look and map their activities. One of the big concerns at the moment that's that's out there, um, and by the way, fun fact, there is a massive at the moment we're at the we're at, we're at the beginning of a massive intergenerational transfer of wealth where older investors um, just uh, just natural course of things there's a transfer of wealth happening from from older generations to younger generations and it's not always the case but a lot of times the younger investors recognize the risk of human induced climate change and global warming see the changes that are happening to biodiversity see the changes that are happening to human health from pollution and rising temperatures and increased natural disaster activity and storms, extreme storms. And they're looking, they are looking for opportunities to put their investment funds to work in a way that is aligned with long-term good outcomes for their investments. And they're looking to um, identify companies that lots of companies are making claims about how they're trying to be more sustainable, how they're trying to not impact what's left of nature, but they're trying to like source responsibly, um, you know, get the ingredients from countries that are following international treaties about preserving forests and preserving biodiversity. Um, and this is where that fact that most countries are using data that's way out of date. Um, how can you how can you trust those numbers? You at the moment, it's all based on basically self-reported statistics that people have to just trust that these companies are doing the right thing. And this leads to a lot of, I think, a very um, understandable cynicism in younger generations and, and in younger investors, that there's an awful lot of greenwashing going on where people can say that they're doing something to reduce their impact on the world, but who's really holding them accountable? And in the United States, if there's a mining disaster in West Virginia and a tailing pond collapses and floods of river valley and people die and a bunch of stuff is damaged, we take it for granted is another one of these take it for granted things. We take it for granted that the EPA will detect that pollution event and re and the people responsible will eventually bear financial burden for trying to re restore the situation or contribute to fixing it. That, um, that 
the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, will, again, detect that event and be able to respond and do something about it. Um, we just we just take that for granted. And in other parts of the world, something bad could happen, and it might be a long time before the world g- word gets out. Um, and, you know, in country governments trying to respond to things, how do they even know that there's some major pollution thing happening until maybe it reaches crisis point? So... So one of the benefits that I see with the democratization of this technology that enables global scale, high cadence monitoring of anywhere in the world is that we can now achieve something that's the opposite of greenwashing. Instead of everybody having to like trust people's own reporting and, and, and risk greenwashing all over the place, we can instead use technology to help establish which Actors in the environment, in the in the economy, are provably green. Who are the people who are who are the organizations that are really meeting their sustainability commitments, who are really being mindful about their impact to the world and trying to manage that in a way that helps? And how can they show that so that the stakeholders, the governments, the investors, the financial organizations can reward them? for actually being part of the solution. And if you can show that some organizations are now part of the solution rather than being parts of the problem, um, now you've got a, a data-driven basis for helping to spread those scheme, those policies, those methodologies that work to the rest of the sector for whatever industry that company's in. Um, when a conservation group really figures out how to work with local communities, to protect the environment, and um, there's tons of good cases of uh, conservation groups working with indigenous communities and local peoples to um, basically pay people to not have to sell out their land to some forestry company or not have to sell out their land to some polluting industry. And um, and if you can show that those impacts are happening, there's tons of cases where not just world governments but also indigenous communities can show how they're indigenous controlled land is being preserved more intactly than the surrounding land that's that's no longer under indigenous control. There's just tons of opportunity to help the folks who are trying to save the world, give them the data they need to show that they're doing what they say they're doing, um, spread the techniques that work, and allow investors, philanthropists, country governments that want to invest in success to find those success cases to invest in. I might be uh, playing devil's advocate a little bit, but isn't that just moving the trust into a private company? In this case, that would be you. But like, from an outside perspective, isn't that moving the problem a little bit? Okay. So it would be if we were now claiming to be the arbiters of what's true or not. But one of the reasons, and this gets back to the point about it, that that uh, saving the world is going to be a team sport between all the different types of organization. Um, we're a private company. Um, I, I think we're a we're an impact driven company, and I think we we we're an unusual sort of company. But still, lots of people are justifiably skeptical about any company with dot com as a su- suffix. So you don't need to believe us. When we do our open science impact work, we have a publication in a scientifically peer-reviewed journal. We provide the validation data so that anybody can check the accuracy that we're claiming. And then we provide the data to the UN, for example, the way we provide our annual global maps to the UN Biodiversity Lab. And then we let the UN be the yeah. Um, gold stamp of approval as, and be the one that actually compares what people are saying to what they can see. And 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 and, and, um, and again, I mentioned that there's several groups like ours who are sort of working on similar data sets. Even better protection for the world is when an organization like the UN does something that happens similar to climate change, uh, climate forecast work where people don't trust any one single computer model, but they actually do an ensemble over all the predictions. The UN, similar large-scale NGOs can act as independent watchdogs, averaging over all the different results to 
to identify what the closest we can to truth. Thank you so much for listening to this year's recap, giving me some of your valuable time all throughout the year, and I hope you found these useful. I'm grateful to all the people who I get to talk to you for listening to these conversations and all those supporting my work on Patreon. I look forward to being able to show up again next year to bringing you some more thought-provoking ideas. I hope you have a wonderful end of the year. Maybe also take some time to reflect before diving into yet another 12 months. Mm-hmm.